The next order of business is the daily calendar. Clerk, please call the first item on today's calendar. Item number one, number 5151 five, sub A. Chairman Abney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am pleased to bring for you tonight the culmination of a lot of important hard work and collaboration from the governor, the House, the Senate, and the citizens of the state who made their voices heard. I am pleased to say that the budget we will be considering tonight makes big and important investment in education, and as we know, that means a lot to our children, and ultimately contributes to a healthy and thriving economy. These investments include $1.2 billion in support for our public schools to educate our children, increasing specialty support for English language learners, and expanding our commitment to make quality pre-K slots available for children and families who need it. Cities and towns maintain the current 46.1 million. We also added almost 40 million in property tax relief to fully phase the car tax out. Combined with this, over 20 million more than was in the governor's budget. Last year, we embarked on an ambitious plan to help rebuild our schools. And this session, we are building on that success by making sure children receive the highest quality instruction in these rebuilt schools. We also made some changes in investments to ensure our public higher education system is strengthened and that URI is able to reach its full potential as an economic engine and our other valued institutions can thrive as well. In addition, to ensuring our children have a safe quality education, we also make sure that our safety net is strong and serve those who need it most. This budget includes wage increases for direct care providers serving adults with, with developmental disabilities to about $13 an hour. It increases rates for hospitals, nursing homes, and in-home care providers. We ensure adequate and ongoing funding for bus passes. We also need to make sure our children who are entrusted to state care are treated as if they were our own, because they are. We added funding and updated the requirement for our state DCYF to achieve national accreditation. In recent months, we've learned of more problems and more issues that strain that system and we need the best minds working on solutions. We did our best to maintain other programs and enhance a few that were working exceptionally well, but we also try to remember that government needs to run efficiently as possible before we seek additional help from taxpayers. This budget relies on governor, government tightening its belt, and we've added additional protections to ensure spending limits are adhered to and that we live within our means. Part of this effort involved reducing the authorizations for 338.4 vacant positions compared to the governor's recommendation. We do make ongoing investments in transportation. We provided additional dollars and the budget authorizes two hundred million of borrowing for the I-95 viaduct to take recent advantages of increases in federal funds, surplus staffing resources, all for another 15 million to go for capital projects. We opened the door to more competition in the medical marijuana industry. We support current economic development programs to for progress to continue and add more options for small businesses to participate and incentive programs and diversify our efforts. Now, I'll be the first to admit the budget doesn't have everything everyone wants. Believe me, 
I always hear from people when they think something is missing or they think something should be added. But I know from my work in this building every day, it's a balance. It's compromise trying to satisfy priorities and needs the best we can. The budget before you represents that balance and compromise. From my perspective, there's not a single essential function of government which serves our citizens that is severely curtailed or will cease to exist if properly managed as a result of this budget. This budget will require leaders to lead, managers to properly plan and execute. This budget is complex. It's a living and breathing document that will touch the lives of 1,050,000 of our Rhode Islanders. The members of my finance committee, Republicans, Democrats, independent-minded thinkers, all contributed to a respectful process where we many times thought differently and many times disagreed, but never lost sight of our sworn duties and obligations as representatives of our districts and our state as a whole. However, in the end, it was my responsibility to lead a process that makes recommendations to the Speaker of the House. The buck stops here. I pray that our deliberations today will demonstrate how true democracy, for which I and millions of Americans have worn a uniform, is carried out in public, in spirited debate, but without rancor. Mr. Speaker, I move passage of House Bill 5151, Substitute A by Abney. Chairman Abney moves passage. That is seconded by Alita Shikachi, Chairman Amori, Representative Malsakowski, Representative Hawkins, Representative Phillips, Representative Yuchi, Representative Malay, Representative McEntee, Representative Morin, Representative Wilkinson, Representative Constantino, Deputy Speaker Lima, Chairman Asinaro, Representative McLaughlin, Representative Jackson, Chairman McNamara, Chairman Corvese, Representative Diaz, Representative Slater, Chairman Bennett, Representative Mendez, Representative Shanley, Representative Barrows, Representative Maldonado, Representative Alzate, Representative Casimiro, Chairman Casey, Chairman Solomon, Representative Johnston, Representative Blees Juski, Chairwoman Ackerman, Representative Canario.